Well, I have a sort of suggestion, and that is this, that before we decide either to save the planet or to destroy it, we pause for a moment of silence. I don't mean that kind of grim silence which one observes when somebody says, uh, such and such a famous person has just died and we'll observe a moment of silence in his honor and everybody frowns and thinks very serious thoughts. That's not silence at all. I mean real silence in which we stop thinking and experience reality as reality is. Because after all, if I talk all the time, I can't hear what anyone else has to say. And if I think all the time, and by that I mean specifically talking to yourself subvocally inside your skull. If I think all the time, I have nothing to think about except thoughts. And so I'm never in touch with the real world. Now what is the real world? Some people have the theory that the real world is material or physical. I say it's made a kind of a stuff. Other people have the theory that the real world is spiritual or mental. But I want you to point out that both those theories of the world are concepts. They are constructions of words. And the real world is not an idea. It is not words. Reality is... You'll find, therefore, that if you get with reality, all sorts of illusions disappear. And I will mention several illusions that have not this kind of existence. Let's begin with some very down-to-earth ones, like money. Money is a very useful method of accounting. It is a measure of wealth in the same way as inches are measures of length and grams measures of weight. You cannot eat money. You could have a fantastic quantity of dollar bills and uh, stock certificates on a desert island and they would be useless to you. What you would need would be food and uh, animals and companions. Money simply represents wealth in rather the same way that the menu represents the dinner. Only we are psychologically perverted in such a way that we would, some of us would rather have money than real wealth. But you know, you cannot drive in five cars at once, even though they be Cadillacs. You cannot live simultaneously in six houses or eat 12 roasts of beef at one meal. There is a limit to what one can consume. So that's one of the sort of confusions I'm talking about. Another is that we confuse ourselves as living organisms with our idea of ourselves. That is to say, with a conception of myself which is called the personality or ego. We, that is what we have been told we are. And it's an extremely crude and limited conception of oneself. 
of the actual unique living organism. And we get unhappy because we are thinking of ourselves in this way because we think, well, gee, I'm going to die. I once talked to a woman who came to me and said she was afraid of death. And uh, we went into it in a long conversation. I said, what are you really afraid of? And she thought it over and thought it over and he said, do you know, what I'm going to be afraid of is what other people are going to say. They're going to say, poor old Gert, she couldn't last it through. <laughs> because you see, <laughs> who you think you are is entirely dependent on who people have told you you are. You're not that. Then another thing that bothers, bothers us is time. Most people nowadays say, I have no time. Of course you don't. Because you are not aware of the present. You know, the present is represented on your watch by a hairline that is as thin as possible as is consistent with visibility. And so everybody thinks the present is instead of Now, the present is the only real time. There is no past, and there isn't a future. And there never will be. We think ordinarily of the present as an infinitesimal point at which the future changes into the past. And we also do a terrible thing. We imagine ourselves to be results of the past. And we're always passing the buck over our shoulders, like uh, when God approached Adam in the Garden of Eden and said, Hast thou eaten of the fruit of the tree whereof I told thee thou shouldst not eat? And Adam said, This woman thou gavest me, she tempted me and I did eat. And God looked at Eve and said, Hast thou eaten of the fruit of the tree whereof I told thee thou shouldst not eat? And she said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And God, out of the corner of his eye, looked at the serpent. The serpent said nothing. So you see, we're always passing the buck. And don't realize that the past is caused by the present as the wake of a ship flows back from the prow. Now the wake doesn't drive the ship any more than the tail wags the dog. But we've all got excuses. Oh, my mother had a fit while she was carrying me in the womb. Uh, they didn't bring me up right. And then they go to the mother and say, how is it that you could have been so irresponsible with your children? And she says, well, it was my parents who didn't bring me up right either. <laughs> and so everybody passes the buck. But the truth of the matter is it all begins here. This is where the creation begins. And you're doing it and won't admit it. Because, of course, you're all God in disguise. Jesus found that out and they crucified him for saying so. Because the Jewish people had a sense of God as the cosmic king, the boss. It was modeled on Pharaoh, on Cyrus of Persia. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was Cyrus's title. Kyrie eleison means Cyrus have mercy on us. But you don't have to think of God in that image. When modern Protestant theologians of the sort of liberal type are saying God is dead, they mean not that literally, they mean a certain image of God is dead. Outworn because it was, after all, an idol. And when it says, Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, it doesn't mean merely images of wood and stone, which nobody took seriously anyway. It means, above all, images made of imagination, images made of concepts. 
that one had feet of clay. But it doesn't mean that God is dead, that life is nothing more than a trip from the maternity ward to the crematorium. It's much more spooky than that. <laughs> much more wonderful. But you see, you can't conceive reality. We could say God is reality. But if I call this the sound of a gong, it isn't the same as this. You see? The sound of a gong is a different sound from that sound. The sound of a gong, the sound of a gong, the sound of a gong, the sound of a gong is not... <laughs> So then, there is practiced throughout the world, rather more in Asia than here, although always by a minority of people, a discipline called meditation, which is to get in touch with reality. The word meditation in English doesn't have quite the same meaning, because when we talk of someone meditating, we think of deeply pondering about something. When the Orientals are asked, what do you meditate on? They look slightly puzzled. We don't meditate on anything. We just meditate. In Sanskrit, it is called jhana. In Chinese, it is called chan. In Japanese, it is called zen. And it means, very simply, to stop thinking, temporarily. Not again that thinking is something bad, but if you don't, if you have to stop thinking at certain times. Once you get the knack of that, you can do it even while you're thinking. So you can be a scholar and practice meditation. This is not an anti-intellectual point of view. I imagine that most of you here are uh, either in college or college educated. And the foundation of the intellectual life. Good scholarship requires that you meditate. But in saying that, I have got myself into a linguistic trap because, you see, I seem to be pitching it to you as if it was something good for you. As if it would give you a better future. As if it would improve you. Now, so long as such motivations and considerations exist, you're not meditating. We talk sometimes about the practice of meditation as if it were like practicing the piano, preparing for a concert. It's much more like the practice of medicine, as when you say, well, I practice medicine. It means you do it every day, it's your way of life. So you, this is a very odd thing for Westerners to understand, and particularly for Americans. Because we are so fixated on the future. When we say we want to put something down, we say it has no future. Well, do you? Much better to have a present. Because if you don't, it's useless to make plans. Because when they work out, you won't be there to enjoy them. You'll be thinking of something else. So this is one activity which is curiously different from all others. It has no purpose. It's rather like music or dancing in that respect. 
why do you listen to music? Supposing there would be a culture with no music, would you consider that a high culture? But why do you do it? Well, some people say, well, we go to the concert to improve our minds. Well, if you do it that, you're not listening. <laughs> As you see, music is peculiar in that it is a marvelous pattern of sounds that doesn't mean anything. There is some inferior music that means something. Uh, what we call program music, like the Tchaikovsky 1812 Overture, or some of uh, Debussy's perpetrations, such as the Englutted Cathedral, <laughs> where it's creating visual pictures or imitating natural noises, the beat of horses' hooves, or uh, uh, rollings of military drums, and uh, the sound of the waves, etc. Just imitation. Now, great music, as composed by Bach or Mozart, or uh, the Hindu music, uh, or some of the great contemporary composers, doesn't mean anything except itself. It isn't going anywhere. Otherwise, the fastest orchestras would be considered the best. <laughs> so we, in music, become centered. We come into the present. Not a hairline present, mind you. It's an expanded present, because if you had a hairline present, you wouldn't be able to hear one note after another. You wouldn't know what note you'd heard before. So you couldn't hear melody. But in this, you are released into reality. That's why it is said that the angels in heaven have harps and why they circle the throne of God and sing Alleluia, 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 which although it does mean hail to the Lord, doesn't really mean anything. When you really get swinging with an Alleluia, uh, it's just Alleluia. <laughs> uh, you don't think of the meaning of it, you see, because you can't think of the meaning of God. What does God mean? What is God useful for? And so in the same way you can ask, what does a tree mean? What does a cloud mean? What does a fern mean? What's it all about? Well, we've got on all kinds of weird theories that ferns exist in a certain way in order to propagate themselves. Like birds do all this thing in order to lay eggs so that more birds come out. And the whole point of that is that there shall be more birds still. This is a purely engineering approach to life. Uh, which is completely senseless. Things don't mean anything. Birds don't mean anything. Trees don't mean anything. Words mean something, yes because they point to something beyond themselves. They are signs. But if you take words too seriously, you're like a person who climbs a signpost instead of going where it points. And so if you suddenly say, but my life has no meaning, you're identifying yourself with a word. And that's what we do. When we are, when, if I would identify myself with Alan Watts, that would be identifying myself with a concept, with words. You know, a rather complicated mess of words, to be sure. <laughs> but still, <laughs> I would have made that mistake. So then, it has to be understood about meditation. that it's not an exercise, it's not a gymnastic, it's not the ordinary sort of self-improvement procedure. And one does it not to be good for you, but just because you dig it. 
because at last you find yourself in the center, the eternal now, in which past and future drop away. in which divisions created by words drop away. Can you point to the division between my, four, my five fingers? Can you, in other words, touch the difference between them? Can't be done. Because the difference is conceptual. True. They can all move independently but only because they are one with the body and the body is one with its environment. You cannot separate those. It's like bees and flowers. Where there are no flowers, there are no bees. Where there are no bees, there are no flowers. They look very different, but they are essentially one organism. The head and the feet look very different but they are parts of one organism. Not really parts. Parts is a mechanical word. Like got any spare parts. The organism doesn't have parts, it has um, features. Now, there's not very much point in merely talking about this. You can understand it only by doing it. And I'm sorry that our facilities do not allow you to sit on the floor and to get a sort of in the right relaxed awake position. But before we go into that, I just want to know if there are any questions, if I've made myself clear and uh, if there are any of you who find me utterly unintelligible. So if you wave a hand at me, I'll recognize you. You must be careful about that. You cannot smooth rough water with a flat iron. So don't try not to think. You just allow your thoughts to do whatever they want to do, but you listen to them like you listen to birds chattering outside the window. It would be, uh, the question is, it sounds like bra brainwashing, where, like when in Vietnam they put prisoners of war in front of blank walls. And, uh, of course, that would be brainwashing to a person who didn't know how to meditate. And they recognize perfectly well that we don't. And therefore, forced, you see, it's forced meditation, which would be the horrors. A form of torture that's like people don't like silence, they have the radio on or something, you see, all the time, have a radio in your car and everywhere, all this chatter, 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 chatter. We don't like silence and therefore they know it's a torture for us. It is for them for that matter too, because not many of them are experienced meditators. If they were, they wouldn't be involved in this mess. <clears throat> yes. 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 <laughs> well now you see you've got to realize that we think of the world largely in terms of Newtonian mechanics and that goes back to Greek philosophy 
and all their ideas of nature. And by and large, these people were always thinking about nature by analogy with the game of billiards. And so when a ball moves, it was hit by a cue. And we say the ball moves because it was hit by the cue. So when you do something, people ask, uh, what hit you? What was your motivation that caused you to behave in this way? But you must understand that cause and effect is a defective way of describing nature. What happened was this, that when we separated events into separate bits, you see, we forgot that we had done that in order to talk about the event. Like when you separate a wiggle and you give names to different, say, bays or capes or mountains on a territory, that naming doesn't actually separate them. So when you get motion, time is only a measure of motion. We begin to think about bits of motion. And we forget we did that. Then we suddenly ask the question, but how did this bit get there? And then we say, oh, it was because of that bit that came before it. We don't see that it's all one. After all, when you, uh, a cat walks along, its head comes first and its tail follows. Now, is the head the cause of the tail? Or is the tail the cause of the head? Well, it's all one cat. The whole cat moves when a snake moves. Which side moves first, the left or the right? See, it all goes together. But if you want to define yourself as a billiard ball, then you will play life like the past was responsible for you. And if you believe it hard enough, you'll feel it. And that's what's happened to practically all of us. So we don't le we realize that we are living out of now and throwing the past behind us. Yes, in the back. I'm leery of ask, answering such a question. <laughs> because I seem to be living in an area where there is incomplete freedom of speech. <clears throat> yes. Mark? Yes, sure. I made a pretty clear and I think sober statement of the powers and dangers of these things in that book. Yes. In the prison in Vietnam, I'm talking about the present and the past, with two prisoners, one experiencing meditation and one not experiencing meditation, their experience of presence is going to be entirely different. Is not that difference due because of past training or experience? <coughs> and why would it not be the same? No, it is due to the fact that the meditator meditates and has liberated himself from his past, which was an idea in his head. It's a little bit like that, but language is so structured that I cannot talk without this implication. We can practice, we can enter into the meditation state and see why that would be so. But we would see it directly from that state, not from any explanation.
Yes, sir. That's merely an illusion of grammar. It's because certain languages have the rule that all verbs have to have subjects, like in the sentence, it is raining. Hmm. What is this? It? So, uh, how on earth can one get a verb out of a noun? <laughs> a process out of a thing. See, you just can't do it. It's the old problem, too, of spirit and matter. How can you get a spirit to influence matter? All good ghosts walk straight through brick walls without disturbing the bricks. So how can a ghost in your body lift an arm? But I'm not saying that there is no ghost. I'm also saying well, if I'm saying there is no ghost, I'm also saying there is no body. It's just process. Or we'll call it pattern, moving pattern. pattern. Patterns of motion. Patternings of motions. Patternings of motionings. <laughs> so we are always, you see, language keeps creating ghosts. And uh, like the lightning flashed. Well, obviously the flashing was the same as the lightning. So we divided a single process into two pieces. One something called lightning, which does something called flashing. Yes, the gentleman in the white shirt. Yes, uh, it is, of course, possible to meditate without intending to do so. Um, but it's also possible in retrospect to realize that you were meditating. You don't lose the faculty of discursive thought. You don't get your mind permanently wiped out in that sense. <laughs> you still remember your name, address, and telephone number, your social security number, and who you're supposed to be and what role you're supposed to be playing, but you know that's a big act. That's the difference between a crazy person and an enlightened person. A crazy person might get by accident into some of these states and get so lost that he wouldn't know how to come back to the world of ordinary normal conventions. But when meditation is properly practiced, you can also operate in the conventional world. Yes, the red arm I see over there. Does the concept of will fit in? Not really, no. Uh, I will try to show you practically why it is an unnecessary concept how you can have far more energy without using your will than you can with using it. See, the will implies a separation of man and nature, and therefore we ask the question, do we have free will or are we determined? That means, are you a bus or a tram? And uh, both the concepts are off the point because both of them presuppose a fundamental separation of the individual from the universe. Does it kick you around or do you kick it around? And if you think in that way, you lose energy. Just as my finger would lose energy if I separated it from the hand. Well, now look, we're going to take an intermission for five minutes. In case any of you have to leave, or are tired, or bored, and uh, then we'll come back to the real business of this gathering within that time. <laughs>